today we have a special interview lined up. We have Matt Kahn. Um, he's the founder of Gamer X, and he's a large contributor to, of course, Gamer X Two. And we're gonna have a nice little chat. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Gamer X, yeah, the original and last year, and I would say that was a very huge success. Standing ovation at the end. I was part of it. It was great. Um, so then, what were your some of your favorite moments from Entire Gamer X, like that you can feel even now? Um, you know, I think it was it was really meaningful um, to have a convention where a lot of people, I think, for the first time, they were around a group of peers where they actually felt like, wow, like this is my my community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, that was kind of the biggest takeaway. Is this kind of a lot of people, you know, talking either during or after the con, saying how they really felt, you know, like now now that they had, they felt like they had a space in the community. Um, I think other than that. I was just really concerned with making sure that it was a really good community of people where it was a mixture of fun and energy, mm -hmm. but also one that was committed towards actually pushing forward social justice within the gaming world. Um, and I think it was a mixture of, of you know education, but also being fun and light. And um, I think that we really kind of managed to straddle both uh, spheres of you know being an entertainment place as well as somewhere where like serious mm -hmm. uh, dialogues and conversations could happen. Were there certain kind of specific um, panels that you? really liked or some important events you thought really capitalized on bringing that community together? Um, I think that stuff like, you know, having Bioware and NIS America mm -hmm. and all these big companies there, you know, talking about their, you know, how they make games to be inclusive or, you know, Riot Games talking about their, um, you know, the tribunal system, things like that are really important because it shows gamers that these large companies are paying attention to mm -hmm. them, that they do matter. Um, so those are really important. Um, and then just any panel where they had queer developers talking about how to get into the game. I think a lot of young queer uh, devs, people who want to make games, they don't realize just how easy it is to make a game or to get started. And I think that it's really important that people know that even if you can't code, you can pick up Twine, you can pick up uh, a million other different services mm -hmm. that are free or, or have trials that uh, allow you to make a game yourself. But uh, since then, um, you know, GamerX was last year. Mm -hmm. So you've had a lot of time since then, and you've had several opportunities line up for you in terms of new things. Um, the first, which is Mid Boss Games. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk about um, how like this even started? Like, like did you just jump from the ground up? Did someone just ask you, "Hey, let's just start this this company"? Yeah, I mean, so the the kind of formation of the idea of it was that someone during the Q and A uh, at G Game Racks, and at the end of it, we had mm -hmm. our closing ceremony, that people could suggest things they didn't like or things they want to see improved. And a couple of people were like, "When are we going to see a game? When are you guys going to make a game?" And prior to that, I was like, "Well, we're going to make a game." Yeah, that's not, that's not our, our, our thing, right. but the more that we thought about it, and the more that we kind of thought about our mission about kind of furthering LGBT rights in the gaming world, um, you know, why wait for someone else to do it when we could, you know, we have a team of, of, of people who are dedicated, to have the skills, um, you know, we have an audience, and why not try to make a cool game that features LGBT characters in a meaningful way while they're not being, like, shoehorned in? Right. And that was kind of the idea behind starting Midboss Games and launching Read Only Memory. Can you just describe the game? You, you call it a cyberpunk adventure yeah. game, but for people who don't know uh, Read Only Memories, um, can you describe it in more detail? Sure. So uh, Read Only Memories is a cyberpunk adventure game that's based, can, you know, kind of as a spiritual successor to Snatcher. That's Hideo okay. Kojima's kind of, you know, like I personally feel his best work. Uh, you know, he had always said in interviews that you know, like Police Nods and like the Snatcher series were the game that he always wanted to work on. And it's kind of seemed like he's been trapped doing Metal Gear Solid. Like, yeah. he doesn't really want to be doing Metal Gear Solid, but, you know, it's his, it's his baby. Well, yeah, it's yeah. money, but also it's, it's his baby, and, you know, Konami's like, oh, well, if you leave, or you don't, you, we'll just put another director on it, and then they'll do whatever you want with your characters. Um, and so I think that he wants to protect his, you know, his children, and we'll, one day he'll come back. Um, but for me, you know, Snatcher was one of my favorite games growing up, and I wanted to see more in that line of, of games. Mm -hmm. um, I was really getting into stuff like Gabriel Knight and Phoenix Wright all these different adventure games, and I wanted to figure out, you know, how can we make a game that, um, you know, that features queer characters, and I was like, well, if it's an adventure game, it can have a lot of different characters, a lot of dialogue choices, so it doesn't have to be forced in, you know, like, hey, this character's gay, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, where that's kind of, you know, it, it's very hard to kind of, if it was an action game, you know, how, how do you put that in where it's, you know, natural, uh, because it's a text-based adventure game, um, it's very natural, and, you know, and it feels mm -hmm. not forced at all, um, and, it takes place 50 years in the future in San Francisco. So one of the, advantage, the advantages of taking place 50 years in the future is that, you know, 50 years ago, mixed race couples were, you know, that was completely taboo. 
50 years before that, you couldn't have Irish and Italian people dating. So 50 years from now, people who are trans or genderqueer or gay, like them being a CEO or the police chief or this or that, no one's going to care in 50 years. Like and maybe old people are still going to be bigoted, but like most young people are already going through generations where you know this don't, that doesn't even it's not a thing to them. So you'll be able to interact with people in power that might be queer, and it wouldn't be like oh like you know if you were do it, to do it today, you wouldn't see like a like a trans chief of police. That just is not right. a thing that happens right now. But 50 years from now, it probably will be. Um, and it takes place in San Francisco, so you'll see a lot of areas like, you know, right now we're in Fisherman's Wharf, so you see stuff in Fisherman's Wharf and, and Outer Sunset and Chinatown and, and you know, just a lot of different areas of the city um, because we really want this to be a love letter to San Francisco. Um, I always was frustrated growing up that all games seem to take place in New York, L.A., and Tokyo, uh, and I wanted to make a game. San Francisco. Is there a good spread of LGBT characters and straight characters in Red Only Memories? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where we certainly, we're, we're not intent, you know, like a lot of people have said, why isn't there this character or this right. character? Um, we're trying to make it as, as diverse as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, real quick, we have characters, you know, currently either planned or that have written out that are, you know, queer or trans or, or lesbian or, 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 you know, gender fluid. Uh, a lot of different, you know, characters and a lot of you see different relationships, like there's a, a gay couple that's a racial gay couple that owns like a, a bar called Stardust that you'll find early on in the game. But at the same time we don't want to make this like a parade of, you know, let's roll out every single minority, you know, possible and be like, this is the, you know, minority and, and everyone held that game. Like we want this to also be an adventure game. We want this to be a game of about where you're going on adventure and solving this mystery and mm -hmm. we don't want we don't want it to be so obvious that like we want it to feel natural that you know, you're in San Francisco, it's a multicultural city, and you're going to run into a lot of different kinds of people. Different races, different genders, different, you know, different uh, sexual orientations, different whatever, different positions of power in society. Um, but it has to feel natural. If it was just like, here's the, the queer parade, and here's every single queer stereotype, I feel like, you know, it, it would make, hit all the, the target audiences. Right. But I'd rather make a good game than, than, than just make a, a game that's a queer game. Um, and depending on how well the game does, and if people are clamoring for more, you might see uh, more stories involved. In this, you, know, you might see like DLC, uh, new chapters, right. or things like that. Um, those aren't planned yet. We really want to make a really awesome game, a complete game. And then if people are still clamoring for more, we know that there's a lot of interesting characters that we want to start to slowly like touch on their stories and pull back. So if we ever want to go like, let's deep dive into that character. Play a room for expansion. Yeah, and one of the ne the, the things with game with uh, sorry with read only memories is that it takes place from the first person view of yourself. You play as you know as as yourself. Mm -hmm. you, you know you, you know you get to choose your gender pronoun. You get to choose you know what your name is. So you're playing as yourself, and this you know, we want you to really feel immersed. But if we do a DLC, it will probably be from one of the point of views of one of the characters that you meet, so that way you can actually be in the shoes of one of those characters. And, and we think that will also be really beneficial. If like if it's a character that is maybe trans or, or this or that, that you know if you're playing as that character, this is an opportunity for there to be a lead role for a queer character, which doesn't really exist in, in gaming at the moment in a AAA title. Um, not to say that our game is AAA, that we're a AAA title, but even in like a larger, you know, scale indie game, there really are very few uh, queer main characters. So we had Gamer X, and mm -hmm. you know, Gamer X was always planned to be a one and done thing. Right. Um, because I, I was, you know, I was losing money on it, and I knew I wasn't gonna have enough to make money, and I thought I was gonna make Gamer X and we'd be done, and then I could go back to my job. You know, right. I quit my job to do this. Um, and everyone was, was loving it, everyone was having so much fun, they're like, you've got to keep doing this, like, you can't let this go away. So I tell people, like, yeah, this is it. And they're like, no, you got to keep going. And so I was like, okay, like, let's do Gamer X 2. And the press came out for Gamer X, and people were really excited about it, and people were, you know, like, saying it was awesome. And, and so we assumed that the fact that we didn't get corporate sponsorship the first year, you know, for the most part, it was because we were a new entity. Right. You know, people hadn't seen what we could do. They didn't see, uh, you know, what, what an awesome event that we could we create and kind of like that we're, that if they put their money in, they're going to get their return on their investment. Mm -hmm. um, so we assumed that, okay, this year we're going to go big. We're going to do this really huge venue. People were complaining last year the venue was too small, which it was for the amount of people that were there. We chose a much bigger venue, downtown San Francisco, um, three days instead of two days. It was longer. Um, but with that, you know, our costs went up about three times the cost. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, closing in on, on quarter million, over a quarter million dollars to put on this kind of event. And, and that's, you know, on top of the fact that, like, we have a giant room block that if we don't, if people don't buy the rooms, then that's another, like, quarter million dollars that we're on the hook for. So, all in all, like, right off the bat, from the beginning, we're on the hook for up to, you know, half a million dollars to make this event happen. And we assume that, okay, great, that we had all this press, we, we're going to have way more people coming this year, 
And all these companies are going to want to jump on. They saw the press that we got to get from Vice to Forbes to everything. So we started going around to all these big companies, you know, whether it be, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to name names, but like every big game company, especially ones that loads say that, loads loads. the ones that say that they support LGBT things, mm. and at the end of the day, they're like, we don't have money for this. We don't, you know, like we can't put money to this. We can't make a political statement. We can't run it through Japan. This and that. And then it's getting, it's been getting over the last couple months, and up until we made this announcement, it was getting more and more depressing. Where I was like, these people really don't fucking care. Like they really don't care. Like like they say they care, they don't care. Like they they they, they think this is a silly idea. The other day, I had a meeting with Ubisoft, and it was amazing, and it was something where it was like, one of the first times that a big company wasn't just taking a meeting with us just because, uh, you know, we were an LGBT company. They actually believed in the idea that, hey, you know, gaming is a $90 billion a year industry. Queers make up 5 to 10% of that industry. Maybe we should actually pay attention to them. Maybe we should actually give them, you know, some sort of recognizing, you know, like, recognize that they are humans, and that we, that we want them to, we want their business, and we want them to be a part of our community. Um, and it sucks that m most game companies don't see that, and, you know, I put it all on the line for, to make GameRex 2 happen, and, and, you know, my, my, I know the game, the community exists, I know that there's, there's tens of thousands of gay gamers out there, and queer gamers, and progressive gamers, and women gamers, who all want a safer space, and they're sick of the status quo of gaming, but the status quo works for the gaming companies, and I don't have investment money, and the sales weren't there, and, you know, I'm, right now I'm, I'm looking to, I mean, I'm going to lose over $100,000 on GameRx 2. Yeah. And that's just what it is. And I'm going to make GameRx 2 the best thing it can be. But that's just what it is. What a donation box. <laughs> but, but the thing is, but the, the th like, you know, I've thought about it. And people have been like, oh, we can raise the money for you. But, you know, the, the only people who would give me money would be queer people. It would be people who, the whole point is for them. I don't want to take money from queer people. I want to take money from people who say they want to support and elevating you know, the people who, who they've held down for the last 20 or 30 years in the industry. And those people don't give a shit about us. It's so overwhelming to want to do something good for the community, you know, want to do something that we can continue to do, where the money isn't there, the support isn't there, and the people who really deserve it, the young queer gamers, they don't have the money or the, the voice to, to make it happen. And I don't want to give up. I don't want to admit that, you know, that I don't know that I need help. But, you know, at, at this point, I don't know what else there is to do in terms of like getting corporate sponsorship yeah. or getting you know companies to to actually put their money in or put their money where their mouth is and not see us as a joke um, because you know until now I mean they still they still see women in, like almost every game company they see women gamers as jokes they see gay gamers as jokes because the thing is at the end of the day that's not their core audience and they, it's okay if they lose that 20 percent 30 percent we buy games that are insulting to our communities and and are hurtful to you know to, to, they're continuing to hold down us as, as a society, as, as gamers, and we, we throw our money at it because if, you know, if I were to only support games that, that supported queer characters, I'd play about five games and I would have no more games left to play. You know, so it's, uh, it's sad that we have to accept what the status quo is. That's, and even if this is the last game Rex, like, and, you know, I run into super debt, like, I'm cool with that. Like, I can get a job at this. I can, I can fix my own, my own stuff. Um, what's more important is that whatever the lasting effects of what we do is and, and hopefully it's showing the entire gaming world even if it's just a little bit that gay gamers matter that that we deserve to be treated as equals and having a safe space where you can meet one another and share commonalities is not fuck, that's not segregation and if you think of segregation you're an idiot you need to think about what it actually is if you are a white straight male you don't need a safe space because it's your everything is your safe space we're creating something for the other people so, you can come. Everyone's welcome to these things. We want everyone to feel welcome. But if you are a person of color, or you're queer, or you're trans, or gender binary, or whatever, you feel, when you go to any other gaming convention, it doesn't matter what, the, what the, the, the people at the top say. They are not the most welcoming places. And we wanted to create a space where that's our number one priority. And that's, I think, something that we did, and that's something that we're really proud of. And I hope that more, game, more gaming conventions and more gaming communities take some of the things that we did well and start implementing them into their products and, and services. So for the, the Bosses of Honor, who have you already announced? Uh, I know there's some returning Bosses of Honor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our, our big, you know, returning, right now, but right now we have a couple people are returning. Um, you know, Zach Wiener-Smith, uh, the creator of SNBC Comics, and a lot of people who came last year are coming back this year. We're super proud about a lot of the people who we added this year who a lot of people may not know 
of uh, personally, uh, but people like Gordon Bellamy and Matty Bryce and David Gator, these are all people who are superstars in, in the gaming industry. You know, David Gator is the, the reason why you know, queer characters in Dragon Age and why Bioware is, really has so many diverse, you know, he's like the head of writing on those, on those products. Uh, Matty Bryce is, you know, this amazing queer game developer and, you know, uh, game, uh, cri like, creates game criticism. And, you know, she's someone who has actually, you know, inspired a lot of, like, my, one of my friends uh, who grew up, you know, we were best friends growing up, um, who was a, uh, just recently started transitioning. And part of it was, I was like, oh, you know, have you played Maddie Bryce's game? And, he, and she was like, that, that's basically my life. Like, I, like, I played the game, but like, I don't, like, I don't, like, I don't need to play an empathy game. Like, that is my life. Um, and so it's, it's really, I think, important. Like, it's the same thing, like, stuff like that. And like, dysphoria is that when you're queer, I mean, even if you're like a, a gay, gay male like myself, playing games like that just even help open a window of like seeing like, okay, like things are different for, for other people and kind of understanding some of the struggles that they go through helps really empathize with, you know, some of the issues that they go through. So we have Matty Bryce, we have Gordon Bellamy, former head of the IGDA, and really one of the pioneers of the gay gaming community. He, you know, really, I think, is one of the reasons why the queer stuff at GDC has started to really take off, and he's been a huge, you know, um, uh, just just a person who's given us huge advice, and and I think really someone who has always been. I mean, talk to any gay gaming person who's in the industry. Gordon, everyone knows Gordon. Gordon is always there to help hook people up and help kind of connect people, and you know, be the guy who's like, you should know this guy, you should know this guy, and I think that's really important. Like, I think that he's created more change in the gay gaming world than anyone else. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, the founder of, of Reddit, co-founder of Reddit, uh, Alexis Sohanian, who is one of the reasons why we have our gamers, which is one of the reasons why we have such a great, you know, gay gaming community. Um, we have WWE's Darren Young, the first openly gay pro wrestler. Uh, the actor, I guess the character's not openly gay. So, uh, uh, and um, one of the awesome things about having someone like him is that he's the first openly gay sexual sports character in a game. Um, and he's someone who is a queer person of color who is making it on the main stage. And think about like how many lost opportunities there's been. And the same, that's the same thing with gaming. Up until now, it's never been directly, we don't like you, we don't care about you, but it's been by omission. No games feature queer characters. You play any game growing up in the 90s or even 2000s, gay characters were a joke. Oh, Kanji in Persona 4? He's not really gay. He's just, he's just kind of, you know. It's questioning. It's a, it's a phase. You know, he's just being childish. No, no, just being childish. He's not just trans. It's just a childish phase. And then, oh, uh, great news. You bet you got over it. What? No, no. That is why queer people feel like crap in the gaming world. Because you tell them that they're crap. If you tell them that they're awesome, they're going to feel awesome. And they should feel awesome because they are. So for gamer rights, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you just tell people, like, um, when it's going to be and the tiers that people can still buy their tickets on the podcast, I guess? Sure. Um, so uh, if you want to go to GamerX2, you can actually go and go to uh, GamerX.com. You can uh, buy a ticket. Uh, if you put in the code GAMEREVOLUTION, uh, you actually will get... Is it Game Revolution? Yeah. Game Revolution. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it one word? Game Revolution. If you put in Game Revolution, you get 20% off, so you can get uh, like a ticket for like 54 bucks for the three days. I didn't know that. Or you can get... Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, I, I, I just did it in my head. But, <laughs> but I'm going to make that code happen. So if you go, if you go, to, if you go there and put in Game Revolution, you get 20% off. The ticket's only about 50 bucks, 55 bucks. Uh, where you can get a VIP mm -hmm. ticket. Uh, so a regular ticket gets you access to all the panels, uh, everything, all the parties, except for the Thursday night uh, like pre-party. which 6 is 6 p.m. to 12. Yeah, and that, that includes like a, a VIP T-shirt, and it's an open bar, a top shelf open bar, so mm -hmm. you can really get, you know, get as drunk and great juicy as you want. Uh, and part of it is also like, and you get a VIP swag bag, so we're working with a couple companies to get some cool stuff in there. Um, but really the point of the VIP thing is like, you get to be around people who, I mean, it's just a little extra party, you get to have a really awesome drunk little fun little extra shindig, um, and it also helps really support us. And then we have the donor level, which is really for people who, who want to support the con um, and, and want to do it in a really direct way. Um, and we're doing a couple things where we have a specific donor lounge for tea and coffee, and you know it's going to be a, a lot more um, exclusive than kind of last year we had like a 500 person VIP lounge, which was way too big. The donor lounge is much smaller attendance, and uh, they're going to get some other really cool things like a super Sunday luncheon with some boxes of honor. And, um, but really, it's for people who, who you know have the funds. Uh, we, we certainly don't want someone to be like, ah, I want the full experience. If you want the full experience, the VIP ticket is the full experience. The donor, the donor level is for people who have the extra money to, to really help out 
and make something really awesome happen, and also you'll get a you know get a really awesome experience. But um, you'll with a VIP ticket, you'll be able to go to everything. And the GA ticket, you get to go to uh, all the events except just the Thursday night mixer. And again, it will take place at the Intercontinental, I believe, July 11th. Mm -hmm. Game Rex 2 is July 11th, 12th, 13th at Intercontinental, downtown San Francisco. Um, rooms are still available. The tickets are still available. GameRex.com um, for the Game Revolution 20% off your ticket. And make sure you book your room through the, the site because like, normally it's really expensive to get a hotel there. But if you do the con rate, it's like 200 bucks. So it's not too bad. But it's, I mean, it's like the nice. President Obama stays there when he comes to San Francisco. So it is like the nicest hotel in downtown San Francisco uh, that is in the Ritz Carlton. Mm -hmm. So uh, you will really enjoy it and you won't regret getting a room there. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. For sharing and uh, thank you for the interview. Thank you. Thank you for, for, thank you for letting me get this off my chest. Awesome. I feel great <laughs> now. It, we're, we're therapeutic. Yeah. Settle. <laughs> <Ding. laughs> <laughs>